Um, good morning. Uh, it is my privilege to get to be here with you guys this morning. Um, I'm so thankful to Scott for last night and just walking us through um, how suffering has been a part of God's plan um, all along for, for us, but first and most to himself. Um, I thought that that was just really helpful as we start um, or as we continue with a conference themed called to endure um, with joy. From the outset, you should know that I'm not going to say anything brand new. I probably won't say anything you don't already know. I think that the best things um, in the Christian life are not the brand new things that you hear. They are the, they are the old things that never change, um, regardless of how our circumstances might so the theme of this conference is called To Endure. We will be talking about trials a little bit, about how we respond to trials, about how, um, how we walk through them. I don't know everybody in this room. I know a lot of you. Um, but I, I know that we have something in common, and that is that um, we will all face trials, like Scott was saying last night. Some of us have done that already, um, and if you haven't yet, if you are in a season where you haven't had to go through a lot of trials, uh, most likely one day trials will come, and that isn't the glass is half empty kind of talking. That is just, we live in a broken world since Adam and Eve sinned in the garden. So today in this first session, we are going to look at some difficult trials that saints in the Bible went through, and we're going to ask, how do they get through those things? And we're going to turn around and we're going to ask, how do we, when trials come, where are we supposed to look? Are we called to look for escape from our trials first and most? Spoiler alert, the theme is called to endure. Um, but if we're called to endure, how is that possible? How do we not fear those things or fall before them when they come? And what do we tell our friends when they are in the throes of them? So before I start... I wanted to share with you where, where the material for these messages came from. Two years ago, and a lot of you guys do know this, and I'll be talking about this in the next session, but my family went through some difficult circumstances, um, and God sustained us through that. And in a way, we're still in difficult circumstances. And earlier this year, I realized that my heart was really desiring escape from those circumstances. I really wanted my circumstances to be alleviated um, in their challenges. And when I, sometimes I would do that in subtle ways, like watching television, and sometimes I would do that in not so subtle ways. But when I realized this, when I saw that my heart was just looking for escape all the time, I stopped and I sat down with my Bible and I asked myself, is this biblical? Is this right? Am I called? Do I see God giving his saints escape from their trials? And I looked from Genesis to Revelation um, and I just asked myself, do I see God in the Bible giving his saints escape from their trials? And the first thing that I noticed is that people in the Bible had trials like all over the place. I don't know if you've read the Bible. There are so many trials um, that, that the people of God have had to endure. Um, but the second thing that I, that I noticed is that God didn't often grant them escape from their trials, but he gave them something far more precious, um, and that is endurance. He gave them the strength to be able to endure those trials when they came. So that's where these messages um, came from. They came from me trying to shepherd my heart through my own circumstances, trying to walk my heart through the fact that I am not called to escape from my circumstances first and most, although God does do that sometimes and praise, praise God for that. Um, but that he calls me first and most to look for in the endurance that he loves to provide his saints in the midst of trials. So maybe you're here this morning and you find yourself in difficult circumstances. You are in a trial right now. Um, Maybe you have a child who has walked away from the Lord or who is not speaking to you, or um, maybe your marriage is not doing well, or you have a family member who is sick and, and it is not certain whether they will make it. Or maybe you're here and you're in a season with fewer trials um, and your trials just look different. It's a, it's a dirty house or children who don't obey all the way right away with a happy heart. Um, or maybe you have broken appliances, which can be a trial. Because <laughs> my, my kitchen sink clogged the other day. I'm not kidding. I thought this was going to be easy. It was not easy. Was, I'm like plunging it. Nothing opening the trap. Anyway, it ended up you had to go through all outside the house. The point is, is it can be a trial. And I was applying these truths the other day with my clogged kitchen sink. 
Um, my trials look different than yours, I'm sure, in the same way that yours look different from the person sitting next to you. But the really sweet part about these gospel truths that I'm going to get to share with you um, are that regardless of, of what your circumstances might look like and how they might look different from mine, the truth and, and the solution, um, the good news in those circumstances, it's all the same. It's all the same. And ultimately, it is the gospel. It is Jesus. So are we called to look for escape first and most when trials come our way? If I were going to sit down and give you a summary statement, a thesis statement um, for what I discovered when I sat down with my Bible, it would be this. And this is your first point if you have your outline. Um, In his goodness and wisdom, God is often pleased to provide endurance rather than escape for his saints in the midst of trials. In his goodness and wisdom, God is often pleased to provide endurance rather than escape for his saints in the midst of trials. If you have your Bibles, you can turn to Genesis chapter 39, which is where we will be, a couple chapters in Genesis, because we are going to get to look at some saints in the Bible who went through trials and just make an observation, just, just observe, did God give this um, saint escape from his trial? And if not that, then what did he provide for them in the midst of it? So the first saint that we are going to get to look at and learn from this morning is Joseph. Um, many of you are probably familiar with this, but if not, um, Joseph was Jacob's son, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, he was Jacob's son. He would eventually become one of the 12 tribes of Israel. But as a teenager, he was the second to youngest, and he was the favorite of his father. This favoritism caused his brothers, his older brothers, to be bitterly jealous toward him. And in Genesis 37, we watch as Joseph's whole life becomes a trial. Um, That jealousy, that bitterness that had been simmering and festering in his older brothers comes to this breaking point. And then they're in the wilderness pasturing sheep and they see Joseph and they think, oh, let's just kill him and be done with it. But cooler heads prevail. And when Joseph reaches them, they throw him in a pit. And then they see slave traders walking through the land and decide we might as well make a profit off of them. And they sell their brother into slavery. So in a moment, everything that Joseph has ever known is is ripped away from him, right? He's carried to Egypt. He is purchased by a man named Potiphar, who was an Egyptian. Um, And and Joseph was given favor. Um, The Lord gave Joseph favor in Potiphar's eyes, and he was made an overseer over his house, and things were looking up for a while until Joseph rejected the advances of Potiphar's wife, and this scorned woman accused Joseph of assaulting her, and, and he was thrown into prison. So what is lower than a slave? It would be a prisoner who used to be a slave. So Joseph at that point had had lost not only his family and his freedom, but he had lost his reputation as well. Do you think Joseph desired escape from his circumstances? Well, we know he did. After years of being in prison um, and given charge over those prisoners while he was there, he interpreted the dream of of the cupbearer to Pharaoh, an official in a very high position who had been thrown in prison. And the interpretation is that he's going to be exalted again. He's going to return to his former position. And Joseph pleads with him, knowing this man is going to go back to Pharaoh, a position of influence, and could get him out of here. He pleads with him, and he says, remember me. Um, And in Genesis 40, it says, only remember me when it is well with you, and please do me the kindness to mention me to Pharaoh, and so get me out of this house. For I was indeed stolen out of the land of the Hebrews, and here also I have done nothing that they should put me into the pit. So Joseph has has not forgotten any of his afflictions as he talks to this cupbearer. He was once a free man. He remembers that. And he was once a trusted slave, but now he's in a place that he can only call the pit. So Joseph desired escape from his circumstances, and he asked for it. But after the cupbearer is restored, after Joseph asks asks him to remember him, um, and I'm actually going to have you go to 40, verse, uh, verse 23, it says, We read these heart-rending words. Yet the chief cupbearer did not remember Joseph, but forgot him. And the next verse says, after two whole years. So two years. And the text itself seems to emphasize that span of time after two whole years. Joseph desired escape from his circumstances, and he asked for it, and two more years went by. And we know the end of the story of Joseph. We know what happened after those two years. Pharaoh also has a dream, which only Joseph can interpret. A dream about a famine so severe coming on the earth that it would last for seven years. 
And upon Joseph interpreting Pharaoh's dream, he was exalted. He became the second most powerful man in Egypt. He's exalted. But what's interesting about Joseph in these circumstances is that, is that he never demonstrates himself to be bitter or resentful towards God. Every time he interprets a dream, he gives God the glory. So when he's talking to the cupbearer, he says, do not interpretations belong to God. And even when he's interpreting Pharaoh's dream, he says, it is not in me to interpret dreams, but God will give Pharaoh a favorable answer. So he's still humble, even in dire circumstances, and his faith in, in God's power and in his might are intact. And so he waits there for so long for God to exalt him. Do you know how long Joseph was in these difficult circumstances, in slavery and in prison? He was there for 13 years. The majority of that time was likely spent in prison in a place that he called the pit. Could God have given Joseph escape from his circumstances? Was he in these circumstances? Was he in slavery or was he in the prison because of a lack of power on God's part? Was God unable to deliver him and thwart the plans of a few jealous brothers or a spiteful woman? Surely not. God could have given Joseph escape at any time. God had Joseph in this trial for 13 years and he could have given him escape, but he was pleased instead to give him endurance in the midst of his trial rather than escape. So how did God help Joseph? What did he provide for him instead, if not escape? Well, in Genesis 39, this is why I originally had you turn to 39. I forgot, I forgot right there in the middle of it. But in Genesis 39, verse two, we read a very, very sweet phrase. Right after that first wave of trial rolled over Joseph and he has a slave in Potiphar's house, um, we read this phrase. It says, and the Lord was with Joseph. Think how alone how forsaken Joseph must have felt during this time, right? Betrayed by his brothers, presumed dead by his father. He knows that no one is gonna come looking for him. He's in a country whose language he probably didn't know. And, and if he did know, they probably didn't know his language, right? In a culture that was completely foreign to him. But here in the loneliest place that Joseph could have imagined, the Lord, Yahweh, was with him. And he saw him and he heard him and he, had, and he was with him to help him endure his circumstances. And we read that phrase, the Lord was with Joseph. We read it over and over again. We read it when he goes to prison. Um, in Genesis 39, 21, it says, and the Lord was with Joseph and showed him steadfast love and gave him favor in the sight of the keeper of the prison. And again, in Genesis 39, 23, it says, the keeper of the prison paid no attention to anything that was in Joseph's charge because the Lord was with him. Are these not comforting words for us? Joseph was in difficult circumstances, but he was not alone. He was not forsaken and he was not forgotten. The Lord was with him. There is no place that you can be and there is no place that I can be a believer where you are too alone or too forgotten or too unloved, where the Lord cannot be with you, where he cannot show you steadfast love. And God had comfort for Joseph in this trial. This is also on your outline. God's comfort for Joseph, perhaps, which we see in Joseph's case more than any other, is his plan. We don't always get to know the whys behind our suffering, our trials, our afflictions. And I would argue that we don't need to know the why as much as we need to know the who. We don't need to know the whole plan so long as we know that, that, that there is one and that the one in charge of it loves us and is working it for our good. But in Joseph's case, he was very clearly allowed to see the plan of God in his affliction and his suffering. As that famine stretched on and on, and he was able to see exactly what would have happened had he not been sold to, into slavery, had he not been in that prison to interpret the dream of the cupbearer. And we know that because when he is eventually reconciled to his brothers, the very brothers who sold him into misery, he declares this in Genesis 45, Verse five, he says, and now to his brothers, do not be distressed or angry with yourselves because you sold me here for God sent me before you to preserve life. And again, he says, God sent me before you to preserve for you a remnant on earth and to keep alive for you many survivors. So it was not you who sent me here, but God. Do you see the plan of God that Joseph is declaring? He is simultaneously attributing his affliction and the salvation of a nation to the Lord 
the salvation of so many others that included his family. It was the Lord who gave him his hardship and his trial, but all that affliction was accomplishing a plan so great that it rescued many lives. And in perhaps one of the most famous verses in the Bible, in Genesis chapter 50, verse 20, he says this to his brothers, as for you, you meant evil against me, but God meant it for good to bring it about that many people should be kept alive as they are today. This is who Joseph knew God to be. He was a God who worked evil for good. And we hear the echo of this for ourselves today in Romans 8, 28, right? And we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good for those who are called according to his purpose. The same God who worked all the evil perpetrated against Joseph into a plan so great that no one could have fathomed it promises to do the same for us today. And we want this, don't we? As believers, don't we want God to work out his plan we want what God wants now more than what we want. He uses so often the affliction of his saints and their suffering to rescue not only themselves, but sometimes even to rescue others. I think of martyrs um, all over church history whose sufferings and afflictions have, have saved others, have brought others to the Lord or have spurred them on. Do we have a category for this? Do we have a category for the fact that God might be using our suffering and our affliction not just to do something in our own lives, but to, the, but to do something in the lives of others? That by putting our difficulty on display, the gospel will go further than maybe it could have if it had been otherwise. If Joseph could perhaps have written out a plan for his life, it surely would not have included slavery, and slander and imprisonment. It would have included escape first from his brothers, and if not that, then escape from slavery, and if not that, then escape from prison. But God had a plan for Joseph, a better plan, and it included suffering and trial. If you and I were to write out a plan for our lives, I'm sure that it would look similar. There would probably be no suffering and very few trials but do you have a category for God having a plan for you, a better plan than your own, but a plan that might include suffering and trial? Joseph was in physical and emotional affliction, having lost all but the Lord, all but Yahweh for 13 years, and he desired escape from his circumstances. But God, in his goodness and wisdom, was pleased to be with Joseph and provide endurance for him in his trial rather than escape. If you want to turn to 1 Kings 19, we're going to look at our next saint, and that is Elijah. Elijah was a prophet sent by God to the nation of Israel and its kings. And Elijah lived during a very dark time. Israel, as a nation, had forsaken the Lord. Um, they'd followed after the idolatry of their wicked kings, each more faithless than the last. And one of the hardest struggles for Elijah was that as far as he knew, he was the only prophet left faithful to the Lord. All the others had been killed. And he makes this statement at one point that I, even I only am left a prophet of the Lord. Elijah's job was an unenviable one because these kings to whom he was sent were wicked and they hated him. And in particular, there was a king named Ahab who was wicked and 1 Kings 16 sums up Ahab's life this way. You can stay in 1 Kings 19. But Ahab's life is summed up like this. And Ahab, the son of Omri, did evil in the sight of the Lord, more than all who were before him. And as if it had been a light thing for him to walk in the sins of Jeroboam, another wicked king, he took for his wife Jezebel and went and served Baal and worshiped him. So he's evil. He's married to an evil woman. He's serving other gods and he's doing more evil than anyone who came before him. And it's Elijah's job to go and call this guy to repent. So at the end of a three-year drought, which Elijah had called for, Ahab did not like Elijah and in part um, because Elijah was calling him to repent. And at one point, Elijah declared to Ahab that it wasn't gonna rain for three years. And so it, it was, and it caused, it caused difficulty in the land. And at the end of that three-year period where there was no rain, Elijah, God tells Elijah to go to Ahab again. And when he does, Elijah challenges Ahab to bring all 450 priests of Baal and all the prophets of Asherah, these gods that 
that Ahab was worshiping, to bring all of those priests and prophets up to a mountain to see once and for all whose God is the real God. They'll set up an altar and a sacrifice, and whichever God answers by fire, that's the real God. And all the people of Israel there, the whole nation, and they're watching. And here we get to see something magnificent. So the, the, the priests of Baal, they go first, right? They, they set up their altar and their sacrifice, and they're crying out to Baal, and they're slashing themselves, they're cutting themselves, and they're weeping, and, and there's nothing. There's no response. And then it's Elijah's turn, and he sets up his altar and his sacrifice, and then he digs a trench and drenches the whole thing with water. And he prays to God, and he says, let it be known this day that you are God in Israel and that I am your servant. Answer me, O Lord. And then we read, then the fire of Yahweh fell and consumed the burnt offering and the wood and the stones and the dust and licked up the water that was in the trench. That would have been amazing to witness. I mean, fire has just fallen from heaven and burned up even the stones and the dust. All the people of Israel, they fall on their faces and Elijah seizes the, the wicked priests and prophets and he slaughters them. And if that were not enough, Elijah then calls to the Lord for an end to the three-year drought. And he answers him. The next verse says, and there was a great rain. So Elijah has now, on this day, gotten to see two miraculous answers from the Lord. He's gotten to see God answer him personally through fire and water. So at this point, you might be wondering, where's the trial? I mean, Elijah has gotten to see God personally answer his prayers twice in miraculous ways. It seems like it's been a pretty good day for Elijah, right? And it had been up until that point. But in 1 Kings 19, we see a shift. Ahab goes home. He tells Jezebel, his wife, his wicked wife, about how Elijah had killed her prophets with the sword. And Jezebel sends a message to Elijah. And that message says, So may the gods do so to me and more also, if I do not make your life as the life of one of them by this time tomorrow, in 1 Kings 19 too. Now you might think, that because Elijah had just witnessed such a decisive display of God's power that this message, this threat from this woman wouldn't rattle him too much. But read with me in 1 Kings 19.3, his response. It says, then he was afraid and he arose and ran for his life and came to Beersheba, which belongs to Judah, and he left his servant there. Now, I'm not sure exactly how much time tra transpired between the fire falling from heaven, the rain falling, and Jezebel's message, but it seems like not very much time. It seems like it could have even been the same day. But Elijah hears that this woman wants to kill him, and he forgets all of it. When I was studying this a few months back, this was so encouraging for my soul, because Elijah was a man just like us. I feel like I have gotten to see so much good from the Lord. I know so much truth from the Bible. And yet in an instant, I can be so discouraged or overwhelmed by my circumstances that I forget all of it. And now I'm just completely overwhelmed. But we'll see in a moment how God provided for this weak and discouraged prophet. And that same God of Elijah is the God that we serve today. So Elijah's in the wilderness. He's all alone. He sits down under a broom tree and he's in a trial. Did Elijah desire escape from his circumstances? Read with me 1 Kings 19.4. It says, And he asked that he might die, saying, It is enough now, O Lord. Take away my life, for I am no better than my father's. Better for the Lord to kill him than Jezebel, Elijah is thinking. He's so afraid of Jezebel that it has led him to not just run away, but to be suicidal in this wilderness. He's been bearing the burden of the word of the Lord by himself for so long, and he is weary, and he is discouraged. Elijah was in difficult circumstances. He was in a trial, and he desired escape. Could God have done it? Could God have given Elijah escape? Could the God who had just dropped fire from heaven and brought rain from the ends of the earth have given Elijah escape? Well, certainly. But instead, God was pleased to strengthen Elijah in the midst of his trial and to give him endurance rather than escape. So read with me verse five. It says, and behold, an angel touched him and said to him, arise and eat. And he looked and behold, there was at his head a cake baked on hot stones in a jar of water. And he ate and drank and lay down again. And the angel of the Lord came again a second time and touched him and said, Arise and eat, for the journey is too great for you. God knows our frame. 
You see how, how gentle he is with his servants when they are weak. He provides food and water and sleep for Elijah. And was it enough? Was God's provision for Elijah in that moment of discouragement enough? Verse eight says this, and he arose and ate and drank and went in the strength of that food 40 days and 40 nights to Horeb, the Mount of God. God could have done anything here. He could have granted Elijah's request to die. He could have struck down Ahab. He could have struck down Jezebel. But instead, he was pleased to strengthen his weak servant and help him endure his difficult circumstances rather than to escape him, to escape it. And within this trial, God had comfort for Elijah. When Elijah felt like he was the only prophet left and he was all alone, we see that God's comfort for Elijah was his presence. Immediately after this scene in the wilderness, the Lord appears to Elijah. Do you remember this story? He goes to this mountain and God tells him to go out and stand and wait for him. And a great and strong wind tears through the mountains and breaks in pieces the rocks, but the Lord is not in the wind. And after the wind, an earthquake comes, but he's not in the earthquake. And after the earthquake, a fire, but he's not in the fire. And after the fire comes a low whisper and Elijah knows it's the Lord. So he goes out and he stands before him. And the Lord assures him of a few things by, being, by, by giving Elijah his presence right there. This is what he tells him. He tells him that Ahab's days are not gonna last forever. In fact, he instructs Elijah to go and anoint a different king over Israel that day. And after all Elijah's loneliness as a prophet, thinking he's the only one, he instructs him to go and anoint a prophet in his place to, so that there would be another one. And what's more, he tells Elijah, faint-hearted as he is, that there are in fact 7,000 others who have not bowed the knee to Baal. And suddenly it would seem as though Elijah is very much not alone anymore. What kindness of God here to meet Elijah and to comfort him with his presence and assure him that there is still a plan. Ahab has not derailed it. Jezebel cannot thwart it. There's still a plan and he's sovereign over it. And there's a postscript here. As Elijah was in the wilderness, in despair, very afraid, afraid of death, God could have told him a very small but important piece of information. God could have comforted Elijah as Elijah is so afraid of death in that moment and say, but Elijah, you're never even going to die. This whole time, Elijah was never even going to die. And God could have told him that. He could have told him that he would be one of only two people that we know about in the Bible that didn't experience death. But in Elijah's case, chariots of fire would swing down from heaven and pick him up. But God did not tell him that. He was pleased for Elijah to trust him in the midst of that trial and to give him endurance to bear up under it rather than tell him that. God could tell us the future. So much of our anxiety, so much of our fear is rooted in the unknown, the uncertainty of the future. And he could tell us. He could tell us all of it because he knows it. He has a plan. But he gets glory when his people trust him, trust in his character, that he is good and sovereign over that plan. He gets glory when we trust him in it. Elijah's plan for his life would most likely not have included loneliness, and hardship and danger. But God had a plan for Elijah, a better plan, and it included suffering and trial. Do we have a category for God having a better plan for us than ourselves that might include suffering and trial? Elijah was in physical and emotional affliction. He desired escape from his circumstances, but God in his goodness and wisdom was pleased to provide endurance for him in his trial rather than escape. Lastly, we're going to go to and look at, uh, we're going to go to the New Testament, to 2 Corinthians chapter 12. We're going to look at a saint who also knew something about hardship and affliction. We're going to look at the Apostle Paul. You're probably well acquainted with his beginnings. He used to be known as Saul. He used to be, he was a Jew, and not just any Jew, but a zealous one. And as a zealous Jew, he was vehemently opposed to Christians following Jesus, proclaiming him to be the Messiah. Um, and he was one of the fiercest opponents of Christianity. Acts 8 recounts how Saul not only approved of the execution of Stephen, a Christian, um, but how he was ravaging the church and entering house after house. He dragged off men and women and committed them to prison. But we know that in another one of his endeavors to persecute Christians, that Jesus appeared to Saul on the road to Damascus. 
And on that road, Saul was blinded so that he could finally see. From the day he met Jesus on that road to Damascus, Saul's life was changed. He eventually became known as Paul, and he began preaching the message that he had just been persecuting. And as he did so, a long string of hardships, mistreatment, and afflictions began. We know about a lot of these. He sums up his own afflictions in 2 Corinthians 11, just before the chapter that we'll be in. He says that as a servant of Christ, he has far more imprisonments with countless beatings and often near death. Five times I received at the hands of the Jews the 40 lashes less one. Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was stoned. Three times I was shipwrecked. A night and a day I was adrift at sea on frequent journeys in danger from rivers, danger from robbers, danger from my own people, danger from Gentiles, danger in the city, danger in the wilderness, danger at sea, danger from false brothers, so much danger. In toil and hardship, through many a sleepless night, in hunger and thirst, often without food, in cold and exposure. Paul knew something about affliction, but we aren't going to look at any of those. We're going to look at the one, the affliction that he mentions right after this list in 2 Corinthians 12. So read with me 2 Corinthians 12 in verse 7. Halfway through the verse, he says this. A thorn was given me in the flesh, a messenger of Satan to harass me to keep me from being conceited. Three times I pleaded with the Lord about this, that it should leave me. Paul had a thorn in his flesh. And it's called a messenger of Satan to harass him. We don't know exactly what this thorn would be, but it caused Paul suffering. The Greek word for thorn here could also be translated stake, meaning that whatever this was in Paul's life, whether it was an ailment in his body or some kind of demonic opposition to his ministry somehow, it was not a small thorn, but a graphic discomfort. Did Paul desire escape from these circumstances? Well, it says in verse eight, like we just read, three times I pleaded with the Lord about this, that it should leave me. Paul pleaded with the Lord to remove this affliction from him three times. He had gone through shipwrecks, and imprisonments, and lashings, and beatings, and nowhere do we read of Paul asking for relief from those circumstances, except right here. Could God have done it? Could the one who had struck him with blindness on the road to Damascus, and then restored it, the one who turned one of the greatest persecutors of the gospel into one of its greatest advocates, have removed this messenger of Satan from Paul? Of course he could have. God could have done anything here. But instead, he was pleased to strengthen Paul in the midst of his trial and to give him endurance rather than escape. What is the Lord's response to Paul in 2 Corinthians verse 12, or chapter 12, verse 9? He says this, But he said to me, My grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. The answer to Paul's pleading for escape was no. Whatever this was, Paul now knew that the Lord intended for it to remain more suffering was in store. It would not abate. But what the Lord gives to Paul here is more than just a no. He provides Paul with exactly what he needs. We see that God's comfort for Paul here was his grace. He's giving him a promise in this verse. My grace is sufficient. It is enough to help you endure this. In fact, your weakness makes my power look great. And was it sufficient? Did Paul have doubts about its sufficiency? Well, his response in the next verse is not quiet submission or dutiful obedience. And he says this at the end of verse nine. He says, therefore, I will boast all the more gladly of my weaknesses so that the power of Christ may rest upon me. For the sake of Christ, then, I am content with weaknesses, insults, hardships, persecutions, and calamities. For when I am weak, then I am strong. Paul didn't just quietly submit to the Lord. He boasted. He boasted in those things that made him weak because the, his weaknesses made Christ look strong. And this wasn't just a one-time, short-term sentiment of Paul's. Right in Philippians 4, we read him say something similar. I know how to be brought low and I know how to abound. In any and every circumstance, I have learned the secret of facing plenty and hunger, abundance and need. I can do all things through him who strengthens me. And listen, hearing that God's grace was sufficient from someone who had endured as much as Paul, does this not give us much confidence that his grace will be just as powerful in our own lives, in our own afflictions, in our own trials? The, pet, the testimony of Paul's whole life was that God's grace was indeed sufficient. Paul's plan for his life would not have included, most likely, 
this kind of suffering, this kind of ongoing affliction and rejection and trouble. But God had a plan for Paul. It was a better plan and it included suffering and trial. Paul was in physical and emotional affliction, hardship and distress, and he desired escape from his circumstances. But God in his goodness and wisdom was pleased to provide endurance for Paul in his trial rather than escape. And a side note here, um, there's nothing wrong about asking God for relief from your difficult circumstances. There's nothing sinful in and of itself about asking, asking God for your husband to find a job or for your unsaved spouse to come to the Lord. I mean, if you, read, if you read the book of Psalms, you will see David frequently and passionately pleading with God for relief from his trials, for vindication from his enemies. Desiring escape from difficult circumstances is not unbiblical, but demanding it is where the line is crossed, I believe, is when after submitting our requests to our good and sovereign Father, we are not willing to let them go. We are not willing to relinquish them, to surrender them. And suddenly we find ourselves in a courtroom with God, with Him on the stand, as it were, demanding answers or change in our circumstances. We submit our requests to our Father who knows exactly what we need. And then we let them go. And we trust that His plan is better than ours. 1 Peter chapter 5, verses 6 and 7 have been, has been one of my favorite passages for a while. You can go there if you can get there quickly or not. Um, the second part of this verse, casting our anxieties on him because he cares for us, is, is well known. But the first part is just as important. It's been so, so important in my own life. And the whole section, 1 Peter chapter 5, verses 6 and 7, says this. It says, it commands us, Humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, so that at the proper time he may exalt you, casting all your anxieties on him because he cares for you. We humble ourselves. We humble ourselves under his mighty hand, and we wait right there under that good and that mighty hand for him to exalt us out of our difficulty. And you know what? We might only wait for a few minutes. We might only wait for a few days or it might be 13 years in slavery in prison, but we stay under that mighty and good hand and we look to him and we wait for him to exalt us at the proper time. Sometimes that exalting looks like Joseph getting out of prison and coming to a position of, of great power and authority. And sometimes this exalting looks a lot more like death, like a weak and frail body becoming resurrected and imperishable in an instant but we humble ourselves, meaning we are not anxious. We cast those anxieties on him because we know we don't need to fear the future if he cares for us. God has promised to work it out for our good and his glory. And that doesn't mean that hard things won't come our way, but it does mean that when they do, we can trust that not only is there a plan, but it is better than ours. And we recall that the same comforts God had for Joseph and for Elijah and for Paul, he has for us today. Right? He promises us his plan. In Romans 8, we're actually able to see so much more of God's plan than Joseph was able to see. I mean, he's in Genesis chapter 39, and we have Genesis through Revelation. We have 65, we have, we have 60, so many more books. There are 66 books in the Bible. <laughs> don't do math while you're speaking. Just don't do it. <laughs> we know so much more of his plan, and we know that he promises to work it for good. And he promises us his presence, right? In Matthew 28, after Jesus has risen from the dead and declares that all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to him, we hear this promise, I am with you always to the end of the age. And that idea is repeated in, in Hebrews 13 when the author is, is talking actually about contentment. And he quotes from Deuteronomy and he says, be content with what you have for he has said, I will never leave you or forsake you. And he promises us grace like he did for Paul. Not just saving grace, the grace that saves us, um, by grace you've been saved by faith, but, but grace to endure the trials and temptations of this world. Titus 2.11 tells us that that same grace that appeared to save us also trains us to renounce ungodliness and worldly passions and to live self-controlled, upright, and godly lives in this present age. So not only past grace to save us and present grace to sustain us, but he has future grace in store for us. When I think about heaven, I actually think about this verse in Ephesians 2, chapter 2, verse 7. Um, 
He says that we've been made alive together with Christ so that in the coming ages, he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace and kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. There's so much grace there. It's immeasurable how much grace there is. And the same God who was with Joseph in his affliction and the same God who strengthened Elijah when he was weak and the same God who gave Paul the grace not just to accept his affliction but boast in it is the same God that we serve today. None of us voluntarily write a story in which we had trials and suffering, but God did. And my friends, may we not forget, like Scott reminded us last night, that those trials and afflictions were orchestrated to come first and most to himself for us. Suffering has always been a part of his plan, first and most for himself. I have four kids, as Anne mentioned. My eldest two are 13 and 11, and sometimes they help me do the dishes. Sometimes that's risky, as you're going to see from this example. So a few weeks ago, I had these two water pitchers, um, and they were washing them. And after they were done washing them, they set them upside down to dry next to the dish drainer. Um, And wouldn't you know it, one of them accidentally knocked it off onto the tile, and it just shattered, shattered into thousands of tiny glass, dangerous pieces. I mean, it never ceases to amaze me how far glass can get. You know what I'm saying? It's just like, it's the one drop is all. It's not like people are kicking it. It's just the one drop. Um, And all of a sudden, the kitchen was turned into this war zone of of shards and slivers, and everybody has to wear shoes, and you sweep, and you sweep, and you sweep, um, and you still discover pieces months later. I was actually feeling pretty confident about that cleanup until they broke the other one the next night. (laughs) I'm telling you these truths. They apply all the time. Um... But I was thinking about how, how easy it was to break that glass pitcher and about how much more difficult it would be to put that pitcher back together, right? Restoring that pitcher and making it just as strong as it had been in the first place, or maybe even stronger. It was so much easier to break it than it was to restore it. And when I think about how shattered the relationship was between God and humanity after Adam and Eve fell in the garden, after they sinned against him, it's like that water pitcher shattering, right? But times infinity. They chose sin over God. And we have been doing that by nature ever since, sinning against the God who made us for his glory and even sometimes glorying in that sin. All the sin across time and history piling up against a God who clearly tells us in Romans 6, 23 that the wages of sin is death. And we have earned for ourselves as humanity the just wrath of a good and holy God again and again and again. We have no currency he accepts to pay that debt. We have no way to bridge that gap. We have no way, once that glass pitcher was broken, we have no way to put that back together again. But that's exactly what God did because he takes things that are irretrievably lost and broken and he restores them and he makes them new. From the foundation of the world, he had a good plan to seek and save the lost, to mend the broken, to heal the sick. And that plan included the infinite suffering and affliction of Jesus, the son of God, God himself. He became a man and he lived the perfect life we couldn't live. And on the cross that day, he took upon himself the sins of everyone who would believe in him so that he could give sinners his righteousness, so that he could bridge that gap and pay the debts that we owe. He took on that cross that day, he became broken and he took what was irretrievably broken, even that sliver in the corner under the kitchen island, and he put it back together and he made it something brand new. He made it a new creation. God declares this in in Isaiah 55. He says, For my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are my ways your ways, declares the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. Do you know what the context of these verses are? Some of you might know these verses. The context of these verses is, is salvation. It's pardon. He says, Seek the Lord while he might be found. Let him return to the Lord and the Lord will have compassion on him and to our God for he will abundantly pardon. His ways are not our ways and his thoughts are not our thoughts and that is a good thing because if if his thoughts were like ours, we would not be saved. Romans 5 says, for one will scarcely die for a righteous person, though perhaps for a good person one would dare even to die. But God shows his love for us and that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. God's ways are not our ways, but they are better 
God had a plan since the beginning of time for our salvation, and it included suffering and trial for the Son of God. Jesus did not have to endure the cross that day, but he did it to save us because he loved us so that we could endure the trials that we have today, not alone, but with his plan and his presence and his grace. In his goodness and wisdom, God is often pleased to provide endurance rather than escape for his saints in the midst of trials. Are there circumstances today from which you desire escape? Have you considered that God might be more glorified by you humbling yourself and trusting him in the midst of those circumstances than by giving you escape from them? Do you wait in the midst of your affliction under that mighty hand and look to him and wait for him to exalt you at the proper time out, out of it? Shouldn't this affect how we talk about trials, right? The way that we communicate about them. Should not we be declaring the faithfulness and the trustworthiness of our God to sustain us and help us endure in the midst of our affliction rather than complaining when we are not granted escape? Let's pray. Father, thank you for another day to live and breathe. Lord, you are um, the God of the very, very big things, space and the planets and the stars. And you're also the God of the very, very small things, the tiniest insects and, um, and molecules, Lord. You see it all. And all things are working together according to your purpose. And it is a good purpose. Lord, I thank you for each of the women in this room. I thank you that you have brought them here. And God, I just pray for all of us that no matter what circumstances we find ourselves in this morning, whether there are, is not a trial in sight, Lord, or whether um, we are in deep waters, I pray that we would look to you first and most, not for escape from our trial, but for endurance, Lord, that we would want to glorify you in the midst of them and, and trust that your plan is better than ours. And we know that because your love for us is not proven in giving us escape from our trials. First and most, Lord, your love was proven for us on the cross when you sent your son to die and take away our biggest problem, our sin and your wrath against it. You are good, Lord. Thank you for this time. It is in the name of Jesus that we pray. Amen.